Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Threads Editor Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by Threads staff members. Hi, I'm Carol Frazier, the Senior Technical Editor. Hi, I'm Janine Clegg, Senior Copy Production Editor. And our special guest for this episode is Daryl Lancaster. Hi, I'm Daryl Lancaster. It's so much fun to be here. Well, welcome, Daryl. Thank you for being on Sewing with Threads. And I want to give a little introduction for you. Uh, Daryl has written frequently for us, and her articles are some of the most popular we've published. Mm -hmm. She's been sewing for more than 50 years and teaches garment construction and related topics to weavers and other uh, fiber enthusiasts. Before that, she was a production weaver for 10 years and sold her handwoven clothing. She was also the contributing features editor for six years at Handwoven Magazine and wrote the fashion and color forecast column. You can read her blog, take one of her online classes, and find out more about her at weaversew.com. It's time for five speedy sewing questions. Daryl, who taught you to sew? I don't do speedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mother, actually. She was a homemaker, but she was amazing with the sewing machine. And so when I was 10 years old, she decided it was time for me to learn to sew. And she taught tailoring in adult school. Uh, about that time. And so I was her test subject. If I understood her handouts at 10 years old, she figured her her adult students would have a spit and chance. <laughs> and so by the time I was 15, I was tailoring coats and I had a little dressmaking business in my town. <laughs> wow. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> the best summer job Ugh, or all year best. round job. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. So what are you working on now? Well, um, because I travel around to teach, I am not in my studio very much and haven't been since the summer, which is, I look at my looms, they're empty. I look at my sewing machine, there's nothing there. But because we're preparing to do um, some, some videos in the mm -hmm. next couple of days, I spent a lot of time building garments that are partially constructed. And so there are five that are in progress that I cannot wait till this is all over and I finish traveling and I can put them together. So more often than not, it's my teaching that inspires me to do a project that I then have to eventually complete. And those are fun. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your favorite fabric to work with? I'm going to have to say um, wool because it is so yielding and it does whatever you want. But because I'm a hand weaver, handwoven fabric is way more challenging than anything that you could come up with commercially. And so that always presents a whole like, bunch of challenges and it presents um, some real uh, detours that I have to take in the sewing process. And I love that each piece is something unique. So it's kind of a toss up between wool, which is so infinitely <laughs> desirable to sew and hand woven fabric, which always makes me head scratch before I go to bed at night and wake up in the middle of the night. There's something about menopausal sleeplessness, which is great because, <laughs> because you wake up in the middle of the night going, oh, wait, I think I know what to do about this. <laughs> Okay, so what's your favorite sewing term? Favorite sewing term. My students tell me that I am the grain line police <laughs> and that grain lines matter. The grain lines matter and, and partly because I come from a hand weaving, you know, I make cloth, mm -hmm. so I understand how cloth is put together and responds. And grain lines are the heart of everything from pattern design, pattern alterations, to how you cut things out, how you put them together, how you treat the fabric. And that's really, um, that's really the underlying base for everything. I think you're the first person to answer grain line and I can really see where that comes from. Uh -huh. it's, it's something uh -huh. we all need to think about right. more. Right, <laughs> Definitely. And the final question is, what do you love most about sewing? I learned to sew when most people are just getting started in life. And so I do not know, I don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't sewing. And I will tell you that no matter what happens in life, and I've been through a few challenges, let us say, the sewing machine has never, ever given me any kind of grief ever. It is the one thing in life I have control over. And if I don't like what I did, I take it out. Because it is so process-based, 
um, because it is so process based, you don't. Um, it's not about the goal. It's about how you get there. And so when you have to back up and redo it, it's all part of the process. And I love that about sewing. And what I, what I also love is that there's a left half and a right half of the body. So you do something and then, <laughs> then you get to do it again to kind of reinforce it when you work the other side of the garment. And then you move on to something completely different. And that is, I think, I often thought about, because every once in a while I run into a craftsman um, like myself, and someone will have a tragedy, a house fire, a hurricane, uh, something where they lose everything. And you always think about that, what would I have left? And of course, my creativity and the way I think. But the most important thing for me, if I ever had to replace everything that I own, the first thing I would buy is a sewing machine. It is my friend. Oh, thanks very much, Daryl, for answering the questions. Yes. We're talking today to Daryl Lancaster, an extraordinary hand weaver and garment sewer. Our topic with Daryl is creating for competitions. And Daryl, I tailored this topic for you because I know I first discovered your work online. I had pitched an article for Threads about working with handwoven fabrics, and Mm -hmm. I wanted to find somebody who created beautiful garments saw your work featured in the results of a competition online, and then we started talking. So how did you get started entering your work in competitions? When I got out of art school, um, and I had in this art degree, um, I was taught how to weave, and I already had this tremendous sewing background. I had to kind of find a job, and it was the 1970s, and uh, you can just imagine. But uh, craft fairs were becoming a thing, and I lived in the Northeast, and I began the process of applying to craft fairs. And that process, even back then, was a whole uh, field of study in itself because it involved back then five slides of your work, and those five slides actually sometimes became more important than the work. Um, I don't know if ever was ultimately successful. I did a lot of really high-end craft fairs, and I actually taught marketing for a while to other craftspeople about entering shows. But it was really about the images that preceded my application, and that was the beginning of learning to apply. When I finished my tenure as a production craftsman and then started to move into teaching, um, I began to create garments that were a specific garment would enter a show. So there are conferences and fashion shows all over the country at any given time. And then there's the side part of uh, fiber art competitions. So I have another body of work that I do that is not clothing. But um, the the competition of entering your work, which is for the most part, all done with image first instead of the actual garment. They never see the garment unless it's accepted, or they never see the piece of artwork unless it's accepted. Um, That in itself is one of the toughest areas. And I've probably been entering shows and been rejected as many times, more, more times, way more times than I've ever been accepted because that is part of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been doing that since I really got out of college. And I think that uh, back then we didn't teach uh, artists, craftsmen, how to market their work. I think it's better now, but it was yeah. not then. And you got out, you were supposed to be this artist. I was 22 years old. What did I know? And it was really, um, it was a, it was a long learning process. So did, did you, I, did you though, uh, find that you had to be, become a professional photographer or did you hire yeah. someone to yeah. <laughs> I've done take all of that. Um, fortunately, my second concentration besides fiber in my art degree was photography. So I knew my way around a camera. Still, photographing products versus art themes is very different, very different. Um, And I did hire photographers, but I found it frustrating because they didn't see what I wanted. They saw what they wanted. 
Um, my husband, my late husband was a fabulous photographer and he did a lot of my photo shoots. But even then I'd look through the lens before he would shoot the picture and I'd say, no, they're not even at the bottom or no, it doesn't, that's not wrong. It's the wrong, that's not right. It's the wrong angle. So I, and I actually was paid to be the art director on a number of shoots for other craftsmen because I saw things that people would miss. Um, and again, that's all part of the learning package, but yeah. Uh, when you enter a competition, do you do it, um, do you do it for the vast wealth that you get from it or the glory <laughs> or just for, because of the challenge of, of trying to, uh, sort of, uh, push yourself in another direction or a little further than you've been? Um, the, the last statement that you made is a little bit of it, but in reality, because I am a professional at this, there is the resume. And mm -hmm. if you don't have constant, constant entries in your resume of shows you've been in, mm -hmm. awards you've been in, articles that you've published, thank you guys, um, it, is, uh, it is something that you in the back of your mind as a professional have to constantly keep up to date. So that alone is a reason to be part of. If you're not in the competition, um, then your kind of work drifts away. Um, and I have been asked to teach as a result of work. Well, you saw my work in a competition. You asked exactly. me to write. Yeah. Um, so as an artist, your work comes ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And what else you can do and add to the equation is kind of supplemental. For the vast wealth. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was a little right. bit joking about that because I know that. Right. So <laughs> let me just tell you that by the time you get your images, now it's cheap because if digital, you don't pay. But if you have to pay a professional, okay, you have, and back then we had to then go and have duplicates made of the slides because you never sent your original. So now it's just, you go into the computer and you fire out a secondary and third one and whatever, adjust in Photoshop and you're good to go. Um so that part of it isn't so expensive, but once you get, once you apply, there's usually a fee anywhere from $25 to $50 to apply to an exhibit. If you are accepted, the expectation is you will pay to ship your work, insure your work, pay to have it returned and insured. So in any given piece that I send to a show, there's at least usually about $100 in um, mm -hmm. investment in yeah. investment. That's correct. In postage investment. Um, and I hope that once in a while I actually win an award with a monetary, uh, amount attached to it that will somewhat recoup some of that. But I say that entering exhibits is kind of like an expensive addition to a resume line. I, it's yeah. Marketing. I it's mean, all it really marketing. is yeah, marketing. marketing. And, yeah. You can't pay for that kind of exposure. And now with social media, I can pop the piece up on Facebook and go, I, I just won the, the Handweavers Guild of America award for a piece that was at the Blue Ridge Fiber Show in Asheville. And that went right up on social media and, you know, 40 people were like, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. Congratulations. But that is the, that is the marketing end of it. And you have to stay on top of that. How many, how many competitions do you enter a year now? Do you think? I want to say uh, probably four to six. It depends on the year. Yeah. yeah and it depends on the year. Um, and there was a whole rash that just came in recently. Sometimes there's a whole swing of fiber art. Uh, the state of New Jersey does a, an arts annual. And this year the focus was on craft and specifically fiber. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And so I sent off and I got a piece in. This is a big deal in New Jersey. And I was thrilled because it was one of my art pieces. And I, you know, I was, I took advantage of that. That's what came up on the roster. Now, do you uh, use the same garments or the same pieces of work uh, for different competitions in a given year? Well, you have to be really careful. And this is something that um, uh, that people who enter any kind of competition, there's, there's two issues. One is that most competitions want work that is newer than two years old. That's big. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have this gorgeous handwoven piece that I have made, and it's only good. It's, only, it's shelf life is two years. And especially if it's a runway piece that doesn't serve me well in my personal wardrobe because where would I ever wear that? But that piece then has to sit in the back of my closet. And uh, I'm also really good at cutting up old work. 
because cut it up and redo it and you have a new two-year window. Um, But the other issue is that you have to look at what the exhibition dates are so that if that piece gets in, you can't have applied to another show because what you can never, ever do is write a show and say, thank you for accepting my work, but it's already going to be at a different show. That is professional suicide. So you have to, you know, and I had a bunch of exhibits that were overlapping in their dates and I had to parcel out, okay, these two pieces can go for this, but it can't go for that because that date overlaps this. And you may or may not get in. Most likely you won't get in. I could paper my entire living room with all the rejection notices that I've ever gotten. <laughs> you know, get used to it. That's the game. You know? and, and having been a judge for many, many shows, you know, it isn't about how good you are or not. It has nothing to do with it. I was going to ask you, I know you've judged yeah. some competitions. Has that helped you understand better how to produce things for it? Or does it just make you aware of the fact that there's an arbitrary element? That, yes, that is exactly right. It is. To- I don't want to say it's totally arbitrary because it depends who else is in the show. It depends on what the, the venue is and what it looks like. And it depends on who the judge is and what their background. And if I could give one piece of advice to anyone wanting to enter a show, research a little bit about who the judge is. You know, what is their background? What is their, what does their work look like? And that doesn't mean, so for example, when I judge a fashion show for a weaving conference, the thought is because I'm such a stickler for details and fine sewing that I'm going to judge specifically on that. But in fact, I have a fine arts degree. And so I am uh, more apt to judge on aesthetics and show me something I haven't seen before, make me stop and look at your piece and then come back to it because I'm curious because there are layers that I don't see up front. And then I'll look inside and say, oh yeah, and they did a pretty good job on the garment construction or yeah, that wasn't so good. Um, but th- there is, um, there, there, it's important to kind of do your homework. Definitely. Now, um, there are trends uh, in what is popular art-wise. There's also uh, the trend that craft fairs have gone out Mm -hmm. a bit. Uh, Certainly since the 70s, Mm -hmm. it has changed quite a bit. How has that affected um, competitions and what you enter and uh, how you market yourself and so on? You know, it's funny. I come up with a new idea and I build a piece and I enter a show and almost, I, I can't think of an exception, it's always rejected right out of the starting gate. And and then I'll try again and I'll try again. And um, I think I've got something new and exciting. And then as it gets towards the end of its two-year lifespan, it'll start getting in. I have always felt like I'm ahead of where the rest of the world is. Um, and I don't know what that... It's because I think that we especially Sarah, you in the position you're in and Carol, I mean, all of you, you see the trends ahead. You see where things are going. That's your job. And I think that we are ahead of where the rest of the, our readership might be. And so when we come up with something, it might be, it might be something that just doesn't occur to them or it's out of the blue or it's, they're not ready for and that is our job to stay on top of it and keep suggesting where people go with, um, you know, with, with what they do with their lives, keep them inspired. And so, yeah, I, you know, I follow trends. I wrote this fashion and forecast column for Handwoven Magazine for many years, which was a lot of fun to suggest palettes to hand weavers for the up and coming seasons. And it helped them, especially those who dyed their yarns, to put colors together that they might not have thought of in, in one piece. You know, hand weavers can put lots of color in one piece of cloth. But... Um, uh, but I found it inspiring to be able to constantly remind people of where we're going and give you something to think about. But when I would do it in my own work, it would take almost a year to 18 months before it became accepted in the mainstream. I think you've just answered a question that I had for you, but I do want to talk about this. And it was how much um, thinking about competitions, thinking ahead of them, influenced your plans for your work. Were, do you make things with an aim towards being in certain competitions? Um, actually, no. And I will tell this to my students uh, who are mostly hand weavers with this huge sigh of relief. Um, 
Because I am so process driven, the goal is really irrelevant to me. I think of something and, well, first of all, so uh, being a hand weaver, I make my own stash, if you will. So my stash is basically cones of white yarn, which then I dye because why not? And then I will take that yarn and I will put it together because I had an idea or I saw a weave structure or you know, I'll set the loom up. And then I weave cloth, which I wash and then put on the shelf as a new raw material. So my, so my processes do not look ahead. They are in the moment with what's in front of me. When I go to make something, it's because I had this idea, something I saw in a shop, something I saw in a magazine, and I'm able to um, uh, pull from my stash to create that. Once in a while, I step back, and when I do the final photography, I look and I think, Ooh, that's pretty good. I can use that for, a, oh, this competition is coming up. Wait, that would work. And so I end up with uh, competition pieces kind of by accident because I get very involved in the process that gets me there. And I, I much prefer, I, so any piece that I've ever created, and there's a, a huge body of work, um, I got there by accident, not by planning the goal when I started out. So that's why when you said um, in, earlier in the podcast about having these project bags where you've bought all of the, uh, the fabric and the notions and the pattern and it's in the bag, I've never done that because you change your mind. And, and uh, rather, that's just it. That's exactly that, right. That's a system that never worked it for never me. Never worked, right? And so it goes on the shelf when I, I and actually how I buy fabric. And there's few places to do this anymore. I go into a, a high end fabric store because I travel the country. And one of my favorites, Wachter Silk Shop in North Carolina, closed. And I was heartbroken because whenever I would be in Asheville, North Carolina, I would stop in there. I'd go to the remnant bin and I'd take the remnant bin to the counter and say, I'll take all of this. And it's great because there's small pieces that you can do things with. I'm not a very large person, so I can fit in, you know, three quarters of a yard of 60 inches wide fabric. I could get something out of. Mm -hmm. And that's how I refill my stash with no idea of how I'm going to use it. Which, for those of you who are limited in space, and um, stash is uh, stash acquisition beyond life expectancy is a huge <laughs> issue. Um, yes, a stable. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't. I think you can't create in a vacuum, and we don't. You can't skip over to your local fabric store anymore and see what's there and what's new and plan a wardrobe for the fall. It just doesn't happen that way. And so, when the opportunity is there to acquire, whether it's yarn or whether it's uh, dyes or whether it's uh, commercial fabric to add to my stash, then I can create from what I have. And then I am the most happiest because you have to make um, decisions based on, I actually have this rule with myself, it can only come from my stash. So I may not have the perfect lining, but I have to think harder and be more creative about, well, what do I have? And what can I use? And it may not be something that, that you would have originally thought would be a lining, but it was there on the shelf. And why not? So I end up being more creative because I have a smaller box to work in. Yes. And you know that those are all things that you like. It's not like going to the fabric store and settling for something that isn't really right. you. Right. When you do, uh, when you have an idea about fabric, uh -huh. uh, how many yards do you weave to set aside? Well, um, so I, I, this is just sort of a silly thing, but uh, in, in hand weaving, you have to, you have to wind a warp. Mm -hmm first. And that's the threads that go into the loom that the loom holds tight. And because my tabletop warping mill is 10 yards, that makes sense. So I wind a 10 yard warp and I might paint it or if it's white, or I might just put different warps, warps together into sign of a stripey fabric like I'm wearing. Um, and so I'll set the loom up for 10 yards. The width, um, and, I, and I tell my students, you know, with clothing, it's the most interesting phenomenon because we have seams. You know, I made a dress once out of four scarves that were nine inches wide and with, with a little assistance at the hip because, uh, yeah, I don't have 40, <laughs> I don't have 36 inch wide hips. But, um, but uh, you know, you don't need a very wide panel in order to be able to make clothing. Uh, so I don't have to weave on a very wide loom, but I'll set up 10 yards and then there's always a yard of loom waste. So, you know, that's gone. 
part that can't be woven that's in the actual weaving mechanism in the mm -hmm. castle. But I always sample. I sample in, in, in sewing and I sample in weaving because I'll spend a good 18 inches at the beginning of the warp just playing around with what this warp is capable of. Cut it off and then I wash it. And I think we talk about this in knitting when you do a gauge check is that you really, to get a good idea, you need to wash that sample to see what it's going to be when you're finished. And then the same thing in weaving. You have to cut it off and you have to process it and see how it's going to perform underwater to really know what you've got at the end. So when I'm finished with all of that, and then you have shrinkage and draw in and when I'm left, I may end up with a net of six and a half to seven yards when all is said and done. And depending on how wide the fabric is, that's usually enough to get something substantial out of. Um, I have great ways of piecing and budding selvages together when it's not wide enough. Um, yeah, just put yes. those two babies together. I think I <laughs> talked about that in that handwoven fabric article. And I think you, when the edits came through and you said, uh, use the mattress stitch, I'm like, no, 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 that's a knitting term. You know, <laughs> just butt your selvages and grab your little wefts back and forth with a needle and just pull them in together. And who's going to know? Exactly. It's my secret. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, when yeah. Sarah and I just came back from Dallas from the ASTP mm -hmm. um, challenge, we were judging the mm -hmm. ASTP challenge, and we give them a challenge every year that is um, a kind of an elaborate theme uh, idea, uh -huh. and and they need to kind of uh, answer this whatever question or uh, we pose them. Uh -huh. Do you do that kind of competition, or are yours mostly you know a hand weaving one or some, or something that's more just kind of a garment, just send in a great garment? Um. Because I'm usually just hired as the judge, mm -hmm. I don't usually have the criteria the show would. And uh -huh. sometimes because it's a fashion show, there will be a theme. Um, and the theme is actually important in the judging process. Because you're putting together a visual fashion show, it's different than a static show, which uh, which you probably judge. Was there a fashion show involved in this? There was, there was. actually. There was, yeah. yes. Right. And so that actually influences a lot of the judging because you're trying to put together the best visual for the audience. And a piece that may be absolutely gorgeous with 37 bound buttonholes that are flawlessly done in a brown wool is going to be lost on a runway and it may not be the most important piece that you show. Um, some of the major shows that I've judged were, like we talked about earlier, judged with images first. Right. And I make the decision and I, and I have to tell you, if there's one piece of suggestion that I can give to our viewers is work on your images because that is what it's about. And I looked at pieces that had potential, but I couldn't get past the fact that the garment was stuck on a bush and it was blurry and I couldn't see details and it was of no help to me. I would love to hear some of your tips. And I think that Carol and I could even talk about a few tips based on what we were just uh, looking at because the initial round of judging for the ASDP challenge is through photographs. Ah, you and, and yeah. And I would, I would just say, uh, if at all possible, use a dress form that is the correct size or yes. close to it mm -hmm. for your garment. Plain background. Mm -hmm. uh, bright, clear lighting. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and uh, bright, white, like daylight lighting, definitely. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, have your dress form be straight. We we saw a couple crooked, and it you know the eye just goes to uh, anything asymmetrical, any any flaw, right. and right. something like that detracts. It is it is unfortunate. You know, back when in the craft fair days, when we were still using slides, and you had to submit five slides of your work. One of my favorite. Uh, things to teach, marketing techniques to teach, was I would ask the venue who hired me to bring five slide projectors. Back then we could do that because mm -hmm. everyone owned one. And I would load each of the slide projectors with the five images. And the audience who had contributed those images would sit back and I would project all five at once on the wall. And I, it was the easiest thing for me to ever teach because I had to, I said nothing. I had, did, I did not have to respond in any way because the audible gasps and groans and like, oh, I had no idea. Look at your image on the screen. Look at it. Is this showing what you have done to its best ability? 
And I had done a whole presentation once for a couple of conferences on how to photograph because, you know, all of us, all of us possess a camera, a really good camera in the self in your cell phone. And there are whole volumes of podcasts and things written about how to use your cell phone to take decent pictures. There's no excuse. Um, simple things like filling the frame with the garment, you know, and your cat does not add to the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Um, and so, you know, when you, I, I, my rule is that the, what you're photographing should be 75% of the frame. That's you know, a good rule. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, steam, uh, make sure. Uh, press the thing. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, make and, and stand back. Look at it in the camera. Take uh, Digital is cheap. I run a half a dozen photos and then go sit and look at them in the computer and say, oh, yeah, light's not right there. Oh, oh look, it's not hanging straight. Ooh, that button isn't sitting. Uh, it, it looks twisted or, you know, I mean, just little things that you pick up. And then um, the lighting, uh, it is so critical. And I have studio lights. I have strobe lights, which tie into my camera. I bought a use set years ago. I'm still using them. You can rent lights from a photo place. But even if you don't have that, you can make your own lighting with ot lights, which are uh, ot lights, I believe, are 5,000 Kelvin and daylight is 5,500. So they're really close. Yes. Yes. And they are as close to daylight as you're going to get other than a photographic daylight bulb. And then use a plastic box sitting on a stool or something to shine the light through so it's filtered and you don't get hot spots. You know, you can make up. A, a setting to simulate a photo studio easily, easily. Yes, it's not that it's expensive. It's not that now. expensive. Well, the other part is, it, can you, uh, I mean, d doesn't it make sense to just go outside if you don't have the lighting situation? Um, yes to do and it no. Okay. Yes and no. Because, w because as the sun rises and sets, the level of the sun gives you different temperature readings. And so when the sun is directly overhead, you have the closest to 5,500 Kelvin, which is a lighting measure, and it's the closest to actual daylight. So you get the best color rendition. But depending on where you are in the setting, you know, if there's any kind of filtration clouds that go by, you're going to get filtered modeled effect of the light. If you stand on the north side of the house, which means that you have no direct sunlight, you get flat um, highlights. However, if you're pretty good in Photoshop, or I don't mean Photoshop specific, but any photo editing software, um, you can adjust the highlights and the lowlights and bring them up so you get much crisper lighting in a photo that wasn't there to begin with. These are all tricks, and it takes a little bit of training, and it takes a little bit of curiosity, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, but outside isn't always the best because I've seen too much sun completely wash out a piece. So you're better off in controlled lighting. That's true. And if you're using your phone, which, as you say, usually mm -hmm. has enough pixels to do a good right. picture, but you don't have the control, I don't think, on a phone camera that you have on another camera to right. adjust right. Uh, for right. lighting or right. color. And there's an interesting thing about, so I, I actually will use, I use a 35 millimeter um, SLR, uh, well, actually mm -hmm. not 35, it's, it's actually a digital camera, yes. but that yeah. looks like yeah. an old 35 yeah. millimeter. And um, uh, yeah, you can tell, you can tell my photo background. Yeah, but I knew <laughs> exactly what you meant. What you so. meant. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I still use a, a point and shoot um, because a lot of them have the ability, this is something people don't understand, that the light meter that's built into the camera, if you put it on automatic, tries, thinks you're photographing people. It always thinks you're photographing people because that's what we do. And it's kind of set up to look at the average flesh complexion, shall we say, and assign that to middle gray and adjudge your highlights and lowlights based on that. Well, if there is no person in the picture, it kind of picks something. So if you have a white background, it thinks, oh, that must be middle gray. And then it shifts all of your tones Everything to reflect else. that. Yeah. So um, my little point and shoot camera, which works just fine for emergencies, if you hold the, the shutter button down part way, you can seal in the settings before you depress it all the way. And so what I do um, is if I'm shooting something flat on the table, I stick my hand in there 
push the button halfway, it reads my flesh tone and says, oh, that's middle gray, pull it out before I depress it and I get perfect lighting. So tip, on that yeah. background, you know, what you they, they actually make gray cards. Go to a photo store, mm-hmm. buy them online. It's a photo, it's a middle gray card that you can adjust the light meter on the camera to and say to the camera, this is middle gray, this is what I want you to photograph to. So this is just like a focus lock kind of, the way that you do focus lock on one of those cameras where you Correct. sort of hold That's the exactly button down. Right. It's not only focus but lock, it's light, it, focuses, it focuses the, light the lighting. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's a great tip. It is. So you. I use yeah. that a lot. And if I have someone with me in the studio when I'm photographing a garment, I have them stick their hand in so that I get a reading off of off of middle gray. We should. We need yeah. to keep this in mind when we're setting up our styling notes. Yes. Because we often yes. do just little shots of garments right. and dress forms uh, right. in our, mm-hmm. in not, not the real ones for the magazine, but we do right. it for our own purposes. And they're right. just and quick in here in the right. office mm-hmm. and the lighting here mm-hmm. turns everything yellow. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Right. That's a good yeah. tip. Get Thank yourself you, some, you know, some daylight light bulbs because the yellow is incandescent. And it's very, very, it's only something like 2,000 Kelvin. And the cooler the number, the more yellow it is. So think of a candle flame. You could actually stick your finger in and out real quick. Mm-hmm. But, but a blue light on a gas stove is a much hotter number, and it's closer to daylight. All those interesting things that no one ever wanted to know, but it's kind of pretty critical if you want decent images. I think people do want to know it. I don't think they knew that they should know it, though. Right. So that's right. That's really right. interesting. But having judged a lot of shows that were image specific in the beginning, you just saw it. It's a shame because people yeah. really don't present their work in the best light. Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Daryl, is there any place you go online to find out about upcoming or new competitions? Um, most of the major fiber publications have a calendar in the back, and there will be you know, exhibits to see, but they're by state, but there will also be up and coming. And I know Fiber Art Now has that. I know Handweavers Guild of America is trying to come up with an online source that you can go and look at all kinds of fiber competitions. Um, all the major fashion shows, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all the major fiber conferences usually have fashion shows attached to them, but it might be region specific. Okay. So in other words, Midwest would only be certain states can submit. Yeah. What was your most recent uh, win? What have you what have you done lately? <gasps> well, ju- it uh, it just uh, came at. Ju- I just it was this past month that I got the uh, the Handweavers Guild of America award. Um, so so funny story on that Handweavers Guild of America award I have given many times as a judge, but I never personally won it. And the uh, Handweavers Guild of America is sort of the umbrella for the handweavers in the United States and actually North Can in Canada and and actually Europe as well. But um, but it was really exciting to get that. So um, my daughter, who is also a hand weaver and uh, quite prolific, started entering competitions uh, along with me. And sometimes she got in and I didn't, which wasn't, <laughs> wasn't, you know, I'm very proud, but I'm also, you know, sort of <clears throat> swallowing because obviously the judge saw something in her work that I didn't have. That particular judge. I don't take it personally, but... Right out of the bat, my daughter had applied, had, had sent a piece to this particular show uh, four years ago, maybe, five, six years ago. And uh, don't you know, right out of the bat, she won the HGA award and has it framed on her wall and will tell anyone who looks at it, yeah, I got that award and my mom didn't. <laughs> and so now the first person I told when I was traveling and I got the, the notification of this award was I sent it to my daughter and said, so now we're even. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that one just came up. And then I was just accepted to um, another show, which I didn't think so much of because it was an online and will be printed in the magazine. Um, and all of my fiber friends, you know, were part of a critique group and all. And I started getting notices from them in emails going, yeah, well, I just got my rejection from this show. And another one said, I went, I actually got in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you kind of want to don't make a big deal out of it. But like, I got in. I got in. I got in. So it is, um, it's fun when it happens, but when it doesn't, you just assume that, yeah, it wasn't my week. Um, so there were a couple of uh, nice strings in this past month that of uh, ones that I did get accepted to, which was sort of unusual because it's usually maybe six to one rejections to acceptances. 
Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I know, and you know what? And thank you for sharing that ratio, too, because I think there are yeah. a lot of people who are just starting out and yeah. they feel like there's something wrong with them if they're not getting right. accepted frequently. Yeah. Uh, you know, and have no. a real high ratio of acceptance. No, um, you you can't. You can't do that if you can see the show. Um, when, you know, if, if there's a way to get to it, one that you didn't get into, I think it's really helpful to see what the judge picked, what the judge picked for awards. It doesn't mean that next time around you get the formula because it's going to be a different judge and a different criteria and a different space and a different theme. And I think it's, but it's important to do your homework. You know, we can't create in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And I think that we get lazy sitting there with just the computer in front of us you know, go out and see shows, see every show that you can. Um, I always have a list, um, not so much a, a bucket list for sewing, but a bucket list of shows that I need to see. And, you know, we are close to New York City. Oh, you know, <laughs> no excuse, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> right. And that helps you to get a bigger sense of than what's just at hand. Read magazines. I can highly recommend threads. Um, <laughs> especially Reader's Closet. That's a really nice feature because you get to see what people are creating outside of the projects. Or We don't do projects. We do themes or, or specific techniques. But I think that it is, um, I think it's important to see what people are doing beyond just what's in the magazine. And the Reader's Closet really shows that. Well, Daryl, it's been so fun talking to you about this. I feel that even though competitions haven't influenced necessarily the direction of mm -hmm. your work, that you like the competitive aspect. Well, I do. And I love, I love to sit and pull up my resume, which is something like seven <laughs> pages long at this point, um, and be able to add a fresh line to it. And I feel like I've accomplished something, even though it's kind of a random act of nature, so to speak when it happens. But, you know, you you can never add that line if you don't try. You know, yeah, and just thinking, important. right, it is important. And yes, there is a fee that goes with it. And that's just part of the, it's just part of the game. Um, and that's always frustrating when, you know, I write my little check for $40 or I pay, pay online for, you know, the $40 or $50 or $25, whatever it is. And then I get rejected and so you feel like you've lost to that but if you don't try you never get those little oh, I did it I got it yes <laughs> and then, then part of me thinks oh yeah I wonder what else was in the show <laughs> <laughs> this is point and counterpoint the topic for debate on this episode is do you have a sewing bucket list why or why not I go first <laughs> sure, sure. Daryl, you want to start <laughs> I don't have a bucket list per se of uh, I want to make a wedding gown or I want to make uh, you know my a layout for my children's children because they don't have them yet and I wouldn't do that anyway. But my bucket list is more immediate and I always have a list on my desk of uh, I want to try that technique and then I want to see if I can incorporate it into the patterns that I use for my students and then write directions for it and then see if I can grade it in all sizes. Um, one, for example, I, I'm wearing a tunic that I know that the listeners can't see, but it is made of handwoven fabric and it has a diagonal slice where the upper part of the bodice is on the crosswise grain and the lower part is the lengthwise grain. And the stripes in the handwoven fabric come together in a really cool miter. I've shown it to a number of students. And our listeners can go over to YouTube and <gasps> see it. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, <laughs> yes. There we go. <laughs> and I have had a number of my students drool over it, and which means the next thing up on my bucket list for you know, more immediately, is to draft it in all of the sizes that I offer my patterns in, which um, sadly to say, because people write me all the time and say, where can I buy your patterns? I only use them for classroom purpose. I know. And, uh, but the, um, but the design is interesting and I need to draft it. So my list is things like design a welt pocket for the jacket and then write all the directions for that and then design, um, and do all the grading for the tunic that I'm wearing. So it's, it's that it's more technical because I'm an educator. 
Yes, but I think that idea of one thing branching into another right. is important because I did used to have a bucket list of garments, and sometimes I would even buy the fabric and create these project packs, and I found that I would keep breaking into those project packs and doing something completely different, even though I had notions, everything planned out. And for me now, it's much more about technique. Mm -hmm. I've found that once I fit a certain type of garment to my body, right. I think my style has refined. Right. So it's not as a spectrum. It's more about technique. It's more about refinement than hitting all these different garment types. Right. And the, and the thing that I've always loved about Threads Magazine is that it is technique specific. So you'll be reading the issue and you'll think, oh, what a great idea. What do I have in my stash that I could try that? And those stash projects actually go back to stash and not project specific. And that's really what ha things I get inspired by something I'll think about. See, I was shopping recently in, um, in a consignment shop and I looked on the wall and I stood there for 15 minutes looking at this, the way this tunic was put together. And I'm thinking, I could do that. You know, and then that changes everything. Now, when you see those mm -hmm. inspirational mm -hmm. garments, do you go home and try it on scrap fabric oh, first? always. I am, if nothing else, at Grain Lines Matter, testing the garment first matters. It's huge. Um, especially if you're in a territory where it's not pre-engineered and doesn't come out of the pattern envelope with directions, you have to try it out. And I'll try it on a sample, and then I'll try it in a full garment, and then I might actually incorporate it into a finished piece of fabric. But um, I try everything first. I'm a big sampler in sewing. Do you ever work in half scale? I'm just curious. Um, yes. In, it works in some cases. Um, sometimes I work in quarter scale if I just want to try something. But for example, if you need to see what happens when you do a curve, the curve has to be full scale. Otherwise, you mm -hmm. don't get the real flavor of how the particular things are going to go together. But I do. And I'll work in pieces. Like if I'm doing a neckline, I'll just have a piece that is uh, the shape of a neckline. So yeah, when you're trying things out, you have, you're not going to waste fabric. Um, no. Well, I actually am a uh, collector of old bed sheets and I do a lot of my testing on that. <laughs> that was my next they're question. Cheap and, yes. <laughs> right. what, what, what's your go-to fabric right, for and, testing? Uh, yeah. Right. And um, actually my go-to fabric is a plaid that I sometimes will go to a fabric store with a coupon and when there's a woven plaid, I don't care what it looks like, how ugly it is, but I'll just buy the whole bolt because plaids reflect grain lines and you can look at yourself in a mirror front and back and see if the grain lines aren't level, parallel, perpendicular to the floor. The pattern is wrong. And so grain lines come back to that. So plaid, yes, but when I'm testing techniques, Go through your linen closet. We're all of an age where we have a linen closet that probably should be weeded out. And then it all just goes to stuff for test garments. Yeah. Sarah, I think for your bucket list, didn't you have something, a fur coat you wanted to make? Yes. Well, actually, I have a fur coat. <laughs> there's the bucket list and there's the projects I need to just finally complete. And some, oh. especially if it's something that is very seasonal. A few years ago, um, I made a, a pieced fur coat. Uh, it was out of a Berta Style magazine. Okay. And it's huge and it looks like something out of Game of Thrones. And I just have not completed the lining. That's all the lining? That's all the lining. <laughs> and the lining is installed. I just need to um, hem the my apartment Aww. was covered with fur. Uh huh. Was that faux fur? Yeah, it was faux fur, oh, yes. Fur. Yes, but I'm um, shaving all of that out of multiple, many additional seam lines, and it's heavy too. Yeah. 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 But I have a feeling I'm going to need it this um, winter. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> side story, got in the car to come from the hotel this morning and there was frost on my windshield and I haven't put Did my scraper frost scraper in, there? in yet. <laughs> I was like, well, how am I going to get rid of this? <laughs> yeah, Carol, how about, how about you? What's next for you? You know, I used to have a bucket list and it included things like, um, like a really properly tailored blazer and things like that. And I never got to it. And it's a lot of things have dropped off that list because I don't really wear that kind of thing anymore. It's a lot of work to put into it. And even though I'd love to know how to do those things or feel really confident doing it, I have almost no time to do any sewing for myself anymore. And it doesn't seem like that's a good way to spend my time. So it, it, it's not something that I have on my list anymore. I think my bucket list is like really finally get 
the perfect pants pattern going so that I can just whip out a pair of pants when I need to. Right. So the bucket list is really the, the, the um, useful pattern, basic pattern for various garments. Right. And then I can go from there and it doesn't have to be bucket list anymore. It's just crank things out. I mean, there's not really much cranking of anything out <laughs> in terms of sewing these days <laughs> right now for me. Hope. But but if I had that, you know, something like that, that would be my desirable thing. And thanks to a fitting I had with Sarah Veblen and then one with Kenneth King that's documented in his book, I do have a, a really good blouse pattern and I have a good pants pattern that I haven't quite finalized yet. But I could, if I can get to those, that would mm -hmm. be that would be sort of what I'd like to do. And then the. Um, designer French jacket that is sort of in the very beginning stages of being yes, done. Yes, we all That's another, want to, we all, thing everybody on like staff to wants yeah. to make that. Oh. Yeah. Yes. And I, think you, we, I think we all have our materials yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Oh. We do have the materials. Yeah. It's so funny, Carol, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking to myself, what is? It? What do I have thought bubbles above my head and you read them beforehand? <laughs> because those are exactly the same things. Yeah. I really yeah. uh, want to find... Uh, find the time to get a pants pattern together because, you know, my body has changed a little uh -huh. bit and uh, none of the pants that I own fit me correctly. And um, I would love to find time to get a well-fitting pants pattern. And secondly, I do wear blazers a lot, as mm -hmm. you guys know. Yes. I, I don't know. I'm just very comfortable in them. And I would love to um, have a little more confidence in my sewing to get a tailored jacket done. But I'm not quite at your level yet, Carol, in terms of confidence with that. Well, so. No, I mean, I don't know. I, and I was saying to Sarah just over this weekend that for in terms of jackets, I, I like to wear them. But um, I think I like a more softly tailored garment now. I don't think it needs to be. I don't need all the lapels and all that. It can be much more of a cardigan style jacket. That's more what I like. And that... So I don't really need to have the, you know, classic. So no bound buttonholes? Well, I could have bound buttonholes on something like that, too, if I wanted to. And that I would, would be, love yeah. bound buttonholes yeah. on a jacket. That's there was a very good article that was written. Yeah, yes, I heard that. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I know. read it. Many I know. Times. And it was that very was very good. <laughs> exactly. It was the first time I thought, I, I could I do could that. I could do this. <laughs> yes. Well, that was a great discussion. And I hear a theme that should come up in a future point, counterpoint, and that it's something about finding time to sew. And yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. If uh, anyone out there would like to suggest a topic for Point and Counterpoint, you can leave a comment on the show notes for this episode at threadsmagazine.com. It's time for Q&A. <gasps> so our reader question is, I haven't had good results when I work with top stitching thread. I get skipped wobbly stitches. What could I do to get bold, smooth top stitching? Mm. Well, I think first there's tension. Check your tension setting, uh, and do you have the correct needle? That's actually what I was going to say. A lot of times, skip stitches have nothing to do with your technique. It's the wrong needle. Um, and actually, this comes up a lot in classes when I'm teaching because people will say, well, I, you know, I bought a, and I won't mention brands, but, you know, I bought this needle and I think it's supposed to go with my machine. And, you know, I kind of want to say that look where it was made. You know, when you get needles that are imported from places that might be more bargain basement price, they might not be precision to what a true what the machine was designed for, let's say. So use a top brand and there are a number of them and they're very easy to get and most of your most all of them can be purchased online and use an expensive needle. It will be worth it. And but make sure it fits the thread. Now, I think the question was about using top stitching thread. Top stitching thread, yes. yes. I, I probably have never used top stitching thread because it's not readily available, especially in my stash. What I do is I double my thread on top. Okay. And if you don't, most machines have dual spool pins. And so I'll put two spools. They don't even have to be the same color. They can be slightly off of each other. And then you get this really nice heather effect or wind two bobbins and stack them. So if you get the same, this same thread. That's a good tip because yeah. I myself have had terrible trouble with top stitching thread. And I've tried using different threads in the bobbin, mm -hmm. feeling that maybe it was the combined right. weight that was giving right. me trouble with skip stitches. But uh, I vastly prefer to use two regular two sewing threads. Yeah, two sewing right. threads. Right. And, and the sewing thread you use is just polyester? 
Um, I am a fan of a long staple polyester um, for garment construction. And the, the difficulty with cotton thread, even though I know that is the preferred choice of quilters and what's more readily available, is that cotton, by nature, because I am a fiber person, is a short staple fiber. It comes from a plant, you know, and, and even a long staple cotton isn't that long. And so if you want good tensile strength, it is my experience that a good, uh, an expensive long staple polyester works really well. Um, that said, so that's usually what I have for garment construction. So doubling up on that would make sense. Um, there's a couple of rules when I, I help my students with top stitching and one is to use a longer, longer stitch length. You want to okay, clearly absolutely. see the stitches. It has to look like an effort and, and, and doubling the thread and never back stitch. Oh, yeah, leave right, yeah. long tails yeah. and pull through to the back and tie them off and then take a tapestry needle and bury them somewhere in the seam. Um, yeah, you don't, you want to see clean stitches. You want to see like you mean, you want to stitch like you mean it. And uh, so those are helpful things. Let me also just say, if somebody has wobbly stitches, you know, I, I don't care how new and expensive your machine is. No current zigzag machine stitches the way with the precision that an old metal head straight stitch machine. That's so funny does. because I was just so thinking true. of that. Mm -hmm. I have a Singer 201 mm -hmm. in my office that I recently got back to working condition. Okay. And it makes the most beautiful stitch with a slight twist on it, like the kind of slightly, top stitching. Slight camped. Yes. Mm -hmm. That I would see on like a, a really nice handbag or, yeah. And... I, I had another presser foot tip that I found has helped okay. me a lot with uh, wobbly stitches. And I find with my beginner students, they don't always think of this, but you want to place the presser foot so that the feed dogs are encountering all the fabric where they, where they need to be. So if you're right. top stitching near an edge, I move the needle. Right, right. Take advantage of the, yes, take yeah. advantage of a maximum connection with the feed dogs to the fabric. It, yes, and if you can move the needle, it is really helpful. Um, I will use uh, an open toed foot and move the needle all the way over so that uh, maybe one edge of the toed foot can ride along the ditch. You know, there are top stitching feet, ditch feet. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. So play around with what's in your box, know your machine. And there's nothing like having digging out that old dusty. Yeah, get out the old machine. That old, <laughs> you know, Singer Kenmore, whatever is in the basement and uh, using it specifically for top stitching. But that said, if there's skips and wobbly stitches, I'd want to go back to the mechanics of the machine first. And it could come down to just the needle. Possibly threading, uh, the, you know, uh, making, you well, just re-thread thread your right. machine. Yeah. Right. I have found that. Right. Uh, in a couple of instances for myself. Yeah, that's the first thing I do when I have a student in trouble is I rethread the machine. And that uh, solves a lot of it. Um, I think in industry, the recommendation is to replace your needle every five hours of sewing, which if you're doing a lot of sewing is kind of like a couple of times during the project, not just when it breaks. Because a needle that has any kind of a burr on the edge is not going to perform the way you need it to. This may not play into it, but I was wondering also about presser foot pressure. Yes, that that is a big deal. Um, and I mean, I am a big fan of a walking foot because I'm a hand weaver. Um, so enough said about that. But there is nothing like the connection of a good presser foot to the fabric. But not and not every machine can you adjust the pressure foot presser foot tension. And uh, I know on mine you can, and I will back off slightly, especially if you're top stitching multiple layers, say on a wool jacket. Actually, I am not so much a fan of top stitching as I am of couching. Oh, couching wow. is a whole different ball game, but you can use a much fatter, more decorative thread. Um, you can use embroidery floss, and there's a special foot to help guide it. It has little tunnels that you can flip yeah. that yarn under, and then just do a slight zigzag over the top. It's one-sided. You only see it on the top surface. But you really clearly define an edge that sometimes top stitching just doesn't cut it. So in a lot of the work that I do, couching is actually more important to me than top stitching. Something to explore. <gasps> Maybe that's an article. <laughs> <laughs> do we have, do you have a minute for one little last 
question about this? I think so, Carol. Uh, when you get to a corner or an edge and things start falling out the back end of the presser foot or you don't have full contact, you know, if you're going around the edge of a collar or uh -huh. something, how do you how do you handle that to equalize it so that you, you know, the stitches can get very small or kind of go wonky if the presser foot is not entirely on the piece of the garment? There's the hump jumper and things like that that people use sometimes for stuff like that. I usually have my small pieces of uh, remnants, uh -huh. you know, that Folded I will. Up. Yes. I, anytime I rethread the machine, change the bobbin, I always do test stitches, mm -hmm. change the stitching, do test stitches. And also for that, I will fold it to the approximate thickness of the edge that I'm working on and use that. And I also, when I start to get close to a corner, I resort to hand cranking yeah. right. and sort of measure out those. And uh, I, yeah. I'm so fussy. I will stop, raise the presser yes. foot, yeah. do a little Do zhuzhing. a little fudge. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, as I approach any kind of a turn, I immediately go to hand wind. Mm -hmm. um, Do you go uh, to a smaller stitch too? Uh, a shorter stitch? Not in top no. stitching. Okay. Not in top stitching. Um, and like I said, if I know that the stitch length that I have isn't going to quite make it to the pin mark where I know I need to turn the corner, I will slightly fudge the fabric so that mm -hmm. it'll end in that point. But yeah, I don't usually p play around with the stitch length. Um, where I change the stitch length is when I'm actually reinforcing a point for turning two pieces of fabric back on itself is yeah. that I will do a s three or four stitches with no advance basically turn the stitch length to, as I say to my students, barely moving forward or nothing. Yeah. But in top stitching, I want to clearly see those stitches. I want to see the point, and mm -hmm. um, I, I always hand wind those last couple of stitches. Okay, good, good discussion. Yes. yes, That was a good question. Yes. Send us your question at threadsqna at tauten.com, and it could be answered in the magazine or during an episode of Sewing with Threads. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to see show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads. <laughs>